Environment Outreach Coordinator uh, for Mersey Tropiatic since January. Um, he's working this summer on a couple of different projects, uh, but was so gracious as to put this together for us today to talk about an overview of species at risk protection legislation in Nova Scotia. Um, so I'm just going to let him take it away as per usual. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, if you have questions, as usual, just put them in the chat box um, and we'll address them after the presentation is over. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Emma. And I'll, uh, I shared it before, I'll share it again. It's just a link I shared in the chat. So it's a, a link that'll take you to a Google Drive document that has a few uh, links that might be uh, relevant to some of the things I'm talking about. Some of them are legislation, so I don't expect you know, to have a lot of people passionately reading all of them, but um, there are just a few kind of support links that I thought were kind of useful to have um, as I was making this. Just get that out of there. Yeah, so thank you everyone for uh, joining me today for this uh, talk I'm gonna give on the history and brief overview of species at risk legislation in Canada. Yeah. All right. Um, so a quick presentation outline. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my background and objectives. I'm going to talk about Canada's role in developing international environmental law. I'm going to talk a little bit about Canada's commitment to conservation of species and then have a little discussion at the end about how you, aka kind of the public, can help support this legislation in Canada and in Nova Scotia. And then at the end, and um, we'll have some time for questions, like Emma said, and hopefully there'll be, um, you know, a few ideas from some of the listeners or, you know, I have a few suggestions for potentially another seminar that might kind of follow the same thread. So a quick background where I'm from. So I'm an Acadian from Clare, Nova Scotia, this municipality in the southwest of the province here. Um, education background, I have a law degree from Université d'Ottawa from 2016. I specialized in conflict resolution and I'm currently working on a master's from Acadia University studying endangered roseate tern habitat. I'm doing that with two directors and equally amazing Dr. Sean Craig at the University of saint anne and Dr. Mark Mallory at Acadia University. And kind of my work background, so as Emma said, I'm the volunteer coordinator at MTRI, Mercy Tobiatic Research Institute. Um, I'm really interested in citizen science um, and increasing public involvement in conservation work. And this is really an interest that I didn't necessarily have before um, I started my master's, but thanks really to these two amazing stewards in the uh, bottom left of your screen, or bottom right of your screen, uh, Alex Dantremont and Ted Deon. I really was inspired at the role that uh, you know public stewards can have in conservation of species at risk. And so back to that kind of list of links that I have, one of the first ones is a link to Ted Daniel's website. And it's just, if ever you wanna go down a rabbit hole to really appreciate what an amazing steward can do. And um, he's got you know more than 20 years of, uh, of data that he collects there and really extensive, uh, just so much information. So. It's kind of a neat thing to see. So the objectives for today, um, I wanted to increase public awareness of Canada's role in the development of international environmental law, which is kind of dry sounding, but I assure you it's kind of cool. I, I learned a lot while making it. Um, I wanted to increase public awareness of federal and provincial protections for species at risk and where to find information about that. And finally, increase public interest in stewardship and in the conservation of species at risk in Canada and in Nova Scotia. So starting off right in uh, right into the legislation. So this is just a general definition of uh, environmental law from the Canadian Encyclopedia. It's a relatively new field of law comprising laws designed to protect the natural environment. And so reading that, um, to me, kind of one of the next, you know, questions you ask yourself is, you know, what is natural environment? And you know, obviously that can describe a lot of things. So this talk is specifically focused on biological diversity, specifically uh, conservation of animal species or wildlife species. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, Canada played a really important role in development of environmental, development of environmental law. It's something I didn't know about before making this presentation. Um, and so we're gonna start our kind of journey here at the first global environmental conference in Stockholm, Sweden. In 1972, 
It's called the uh, UN Conference on the Human Environment. And the secretary general of that first meeting was a Canadian businessman and diplomat, this guy on the left of your screen here, Maurice Strong, um, who was named uh, as a diplomat by Pierre Trudeau, the prime minister at the time. And uh, so I said Canadian businessman, interestingly, I found he uh, made his fortune in the oil sands before becoming really uh, an amazing steward for the environment. So pretty interesting. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to get into all the details of that conference, but really two key takeaways I wanted to talk about. First, uh, participants agreed to the Stockholm Declaration. So this was kind of a foundational text for environmental law, you know, since it was in 72. And I've got a few quotes from that uh, declaration. I think it's interesting to see what people were, what countries were talking about, you know, almost 50 years ago. And the second takeaway is that uh, that led to the formation of the United Nations Environment Programme which is headquartered in Nairobi, Kenya. And again, the same Canadian diplomat and oil sands uh, tycoon, Maurice Strong, was the first executive director of that program. So first, uh, looking a little bit into the Stockholm Declaration. And um, so again, keep it in mind, this was from 72. And uh, this is also a link if you're interested in seeing you know, more of the things that the countries were agreeing upon. Um, you can read all the proclamations and the principles, but I took a few just because I thought it was cool. Um, man is both creature and molder of his environment. And then, and then this one kind of touches, I find, on what we were saying, you know, environmental law can touch on a lot of things. And so we see them here say, we see around us growing evidence of man-made harm in many regions of the earth, dangerous levels of pollution in the air, water, air, earth, and living beings, major and undesirable disturbances to the ecological balance of the biosphere, destruction and depletion of irreplaceable resources and gross deficiencies harmful to the physical, mental, and social health of man in the man-made environment, particularly in the living and working environment. Man has a responsibility to safeguard and wisely manage the heritage of wildlife. So I just thought, I mean, I, that is the most text I have on, on one of my slides, so I won't be reading, you know, a ton of text uh, again, but I thought that was really cool, uh, just, you know, especially the context of this is almost 50 years ago. So it goes to show this is really something we've been working on for a long time, this idea of protecting the environment through law. Um, so second, um, one of the takeaways from that first conference is that it led to the formations of, formation of the United Nations Environment Program, like I mentioned. And so this is a 48 year program of the United Nations. It coordinates all of the UN environmental activities. So a huge amount of work comes out of this uh, program. And of, I think there are eight uh, executive directors and Canada is actually the only country to have had two previous executive directors. And um, Maurice Strong, like I mentioned, the, the first as well. Um, but then also Elizabeth Dowdswell, uh, 20 years later. We have a picture here of them both. So again, kind of neat to know that Canada was so involved in this. And one of the reasons that I mention this uh, is especially because one of the things they did is develop the Convention on Biological Diversity, which again is a text that I supplied the link for. It's a little, it's a little long, maybe that one. Um, it's interesting, Canada was the first industrialized country to ratify that convention. And I say that really the important thing to take away from that is that it led to the Canadian National Accord for the Protection of Species at Risk. And I know you guys, I can hear you guys saying, more law, more law. Okay, okay guys, here we go. So the Canada's National Accord for the Protection of Species at Risk, again, it's a link that I provided. I just took a really small uh, excerpt here so it says, federal, provincial, and territorial ministers um, responsible for wildlife commit to a national approach for the protection of species at risk. The goal is to prevent species in Canada from becoming extinct as a consequence of human activities. And the first thing, first thing that they recognize is that species don't recognize jurisdictional boundaries and cooperation is crucial to the conservation and protection of species at risk. So now we have this new rabbit hole we can go down of jurisdictional boundaries and how that is an important thing in Canada for conservation of species at risk. So um, in Canada, the constitution outlines what is a federal and a provincial jurisdiction. Generally speaking, uh, things that are considered a national interest are federal and things that are local in nature are provincial. And 
So again, I included a link to the, the Constitution. If you guys want to go to Section 91 and 92, you'll see the entire list of all the federal and provincial listed jurisdictions. I gave a few examples of kind of what is considered national interest. So postal service, currency, public property, so land is an important one. And uh, provincial jurisdiction, so management of public lands belonging to the province. So this will come up again. And then just because I was talking about the Constitution, technically uh, it doesn't mention the territories, but they have been given quite a bit of their own jurisdiction through respective acts, Yukon Act, Northwest Territories Act, and Nunavut Act. So sections 91 and 92 of the Constitution have these long lists of things that are either federal or provincial jurisdiction, but the environment is not mentioned anywhere in section 91 and 92. So instead, the environment is just kind of a series of subjects that are sometimes covered by subjects that are covered in the Constitution and sometimes not. And so the federal government has jurisdiction over things that are not mentioned. So a lot of things kind of flow to the federal. Um, and also thought it was useful to mention that uh, the federal government also uh, has jurisdiction over any treaty obligations that were signed while Canada was still kind of officially part of the British Empire. Um, which is interesting, the Migratory Birds Convention Act and the Boundary Waters Treaty, for example, are two treaties that officially it's the British Empire who signed those in the name of Canada with the United States. And so now those are both uh, federal jurisdictions. So just giving you guys a few examples of the types of things that have been interpreted to uh, include the environment. So public debt and property. So this is section 91, so federal jurisdictions. And so, uh, yeah, public uh, debt and property. So federally owned land is obviously a federal jurisdiction or is a federal jurisdiction. Uh, sea coast and inland fisheries is a federal jurisdiction, which has a lot of uh, environmental implications. And so for section 92, so provincial, uh, the management and sale of public lands belonging to the province and of the timber and wood thereon is a provincial jurisdiction. You can see that there would be some environmental uh, you know, angles to that wording. And uh, municipal institutions in the province, it's a provincial jurisdiction and that has environmental implications because quite often the provinces delegate some of, or delegate some powers to the municipalities, um, especially through zoning that, uh, so they can actually enact quite a bit of environmental kind of municipal legislation. Uh, property and civil rights in the province and then generally all matters of a merely local or private nature in the province, both provincial jurisdiction, that one I mentioned it, because kind of, they both kind of include private land in the province. And we're going to get back to that, but it does mean that protection of species at risk on private land is a provincial jurisdiction in Nova Scotia. And so the kind of takeaway from all that, and I think we're out of the, out of the legislation now. I can hear the, oh, the sad, well, everyone is sad. Um, but so kind of the takeaway from that is that both the federal and the provincial governments can have jurisdiction depending on where the species are, so the species at risk. So if we're talking about species at risk on federal lands, we're talking about the federal jurisdiction, provincial lands, provincial jurisdiction, and private lands, importantly, uh, also provincial jurisdiction. So to deal with this kind of shared federal and provincial uh, jurisdictions, we have a federal law, so the Species at Risk Act, uh, commonly known as SARA, and we have a provincial law as well in Nova Scotia, the Endangered Species Act. So we're gonna talk a little bit about both of those. So both laws have really similar objectives. Um, so the wording here, for example, in white, the Federal Species at Risk Act, uh, the purpose is to prevent wildlife species from being extirpated or become extinct, to provide for recovery of wildlife species that are extirpated endangered or threatened as a result of human activity and to manage species of special concern to prevent them from being endangered and threatened. And the provincial, again, very similar, provide for protection, designation, recovery, and other relevant aspects of conservation of species at risk in the province, including habitat protection while recognizing gut cut. So we'll get back to that. Or it's another thing that I have the links for. So if you really want to see what, what they have to recognize, you can go check out the legislation. Um, 
And so they both have similar objectives, both of these uh, pieces of legislation, and they both have similar prohibitions for listed species as well. So the Federal Species at Risk Act, uh, no killing, harming, harassing, capturing, or taking a listed species. Uh, the provincial says killing, injuring, possessing, disturbing, taking, or interfering with, so very similar. And federally, no destroying or damaging its residents, no destroying critical habitat. And then provincially, no destroying, disturbing, or interfering with dwelling place, and no interfering with core habitat. So wording is very slightly different, um, and you know, potentially a discussion for another talk. Um, but generally speaking, you know, quite similar prohibitions on both. Um, so, you know, we've seen kind of the goals roughly or very quickly uh, of these pieces of legislation, seeing kind of the prohibitions that apply. So then kind of one of the next questions I thought would be useful is where do you find out what species are listed? And um, so option one, you can do it through the legislation. It is, you know, it can be done. Uh, the Federal Species at Risk Act, uh, if you open the link, for example, there'll be a table of contents and towards the end, there is schedule one list of wildlife species at risk. You can click on that. You get a really clear list of the species that are listed, their status and the year that they were added. Uh, in the province, uh, they're not added right to the legislation. Instead, it's done through regulations. So you've got to go find, <coughs> excuse me, the regulations listed by act website for the province find the Endangered Species Act, and then there'll be a link for the categorized list of species at risk. And you can see here a little example. Again, similar information, the species name, the status, the year it was added. So it is possible to do it through the legislation, but uh, option two, you can use additional resources too. Both the province and the federal government have put a lot of effort into producing um, some really cool resources to make these pieces of legislation more uh, user-friendly. So at the federal level, we have the Species at Risk Public Registry. And at the provincial level, there's the Species at Risk Overview, which is another really uh, in-depth website. And then I also wanted to mention the Nova Scotia Species at Risk website and guide, uh, especially because it's something that was uh, worked on a lot by MTRI. So first, the uh, Species at Risk Public Registry. And again, this is a link um, that I've included in that, uh, in that list. So if you're you know, interested in checking out some more user-friendly resources about federally listed species at risk, it's a really nice place to go. And you're greeted by something like this when you go onto the registry. You can look up species by their range, their taxonomic group, their schedule status. So if they're endangered or not a special concern, for example. But then there's also kind of this access to all these other kind of very helpful documents that can um, add a lot of information and just you know you can see I clicked on a bunch of the links here they're in purple and um, there are a lot of resources here so it's really um, if you're interested in the federal species at risk I really encourage to kind of check out that species at risk public registry uh, so provincially now so the species at risk overview for the province again it's a, a really nice website you get there you have all these program topics uh, if you click on species at risk list, you get a really clean list of all of the species at risk in Nova Scotia, uh, the year they were added, um, their, their status. So roseate tern here, for example. And you also get this cool little blurb um, you know, about the species both in Canada and in Nova Scotia and a little bit why they are uh, endangered or uh, at risk, I should say. Uh, next, there's also the, so that species at risk website and the guide. Um, so this is a really cool guide, you know, being an Acadian, I also really appreciate this is available in uh, English or French. Um, and also just the citizen science angle to it. Um, you know, we can see here just a little intro that was written. It, this guide was created for folks in Nova Scotia, like Harold and Diane Clapp, who are uh, really, you know, renowned naturalists in the province. And who want to learn more about the endangered species that live on the land around them. So I thought, you know, what a cool uh, document to support. And um, so this document, uh, I'll mention it is from 2008, uh, the one that's online that I have a link to. So not every species is listed, um, but it's a really amazing resource because you have 
uh, not only a picture of the species, a bit of a description that'll help you identify it if you were to happen upon that species, but you'll also get some information about its habitat, which can also help you find it. And then also uh, one of the coolest things I find are these maps that are in the upper right hand corner where you can see you know, what areas of the province you potentially might see this uh, rare species. And so now we've kind of seen you know, a little bit of a legislative background on why we have a federal and provincial uh, Species at Risk Act and Endangered Species Act. We've seen uh, you know, the objectives of the legislation. We've seen the prohibitions that uh, are in those acts. We've seen how you can find out what species are listed. But in order for that legislation to really work effectively we need both federal, we being kind of all conservationists and also federal and provincial government, we need to know about where these species are. And so this is where I find it can really kind of come full circle and bring back to my job as volunteer coordinator. Um, and I thought it would be really cool to use this blending turtle as an example, a uh, really beautiful picture here by Jeffy McNeil, I think, a co-director at MCRI. Um, so blending turtle are endangered species in Nova Scotia. Um, a lot of work is done on them, and we only know so far, I think, confirmed of four populations. And one of those, actually, we only know about it because of uh, a member of the public who found some Blanding's turtles in a certain spot. And actually, this year, there's potentially word on the street is, uh, there potentially the public has helped find a fifth population of the species. So it's really cool to have these protections uh, in the law and stuff, but if we don't know where these species are, the province and the federal government have a really hard time uh, doing this work. And so this is a way the public who's interested can really help uh, with this conservation. And so kind of going down that rabbit hole a little bit, um, I want to talk about two apps that let members of the public help by contributing data and uh, uh, observations of species with locations. So first, I wanted to talk about iNaturalist. So I really love iNaturalist. It's an app that not only lets you learn about the species you're seeing, but also contributes really useful data. So in the bottom left, we have kind of an example of one of the observations from my account. It's a common turn chick that I saw this year. And uh, you can see where I saw it, so near Weymouth. And What's really fun with iNaturalist is, so when I take this picture, the app itself will suggest uh, an identification for what species I've seen. And so I'll upload it. And so I uploaded this as potentially a common term. Then we can see here there's observations, species, ob observers, but also identifiers. And so on iNaturalist, you also have this big group of identifiers who look at other people's observations and help you confirm what species that is. And so for this observation, for example, uh, you can see it's research grade. And so that means there are at least two other people who agree with me that this is a common term. And I can't remember exactly who, but I think one of those people, a uh, renowned uh, identifier on iNaturalist, also MTRI employee Brad Tom. So it always feels good when you... Uh, are able to correctly identify something and Brad agrees with you um, and yeah just also I just wanted to highlight just the the really strong kind of participation that Nova Scotia has on a naturalist already um, you can see on the map very few places where there's not uh, an observation and almost 6,000 observers and nearly 7,000 species and this was taken uh, a couple of days ago the screenshot so potentially we're you know maybe up to 7,000 species now so iNaturalist, uh, again, it's another link that I've included in that, uh, in that document. So if you're interested in checking out that app, I really recommend going on the website. And the, uh, the next kind of app I wanted to talk about, which you know, contributes the same type of data that is so crucial we were discussing, so kind of locations and identifying uh, species, so eBird. So eBird is a little bit different. Um, it doesn't quite have the same um, ability to help you identify species that you're not sure what they are. Um, but it still uh, is very similar in that when you upload an observation, it takes the location. So here we can see I saw a spotted sandpiper, for example, on the 28th of June on the New Edinburgh Rock Bar. And so 
uh, you know, we're just providing more data. And, you know, I said a naturalist has really strong Nova Scotian presence, but I would say eBird really, you know, potentially more. You, you can see here 222,000 checklists that uh, public birders have uploaded. Really amazing. And again, kind of brings me back to uh, one of the first stewards I mentioned, Alex Dantremont. Really an amazing, uh, you know, an amazing steward, partly through all of the work he does by uploading observations on eBird. And so now, you know, kind of wrapping it all up. So if you're using these apps potentially and you find a species and now you're familiar, hopefully with the legislation, if you find a species at risk, how can you help even more? So there are some resources. Uh, for example, we have uh, a link here, species at risk.ca slash sightings. So if you click on that, you're brought to a, a whole page where you submit a sighting report for a species at risk. And there's also a toll free number here you can call. So, you know, kind of comes full circle. And I wanted to especially bring this up because right now, for example, my social media is blowing up with a lot of people seeing monarchs, which is really cool. Um, and monarchs are a provincially endangered species. And so if you are seeing monarchs, um, I would encourage you to upload uh, sightings of them, upload observations to, of them to uh, iNaturalist, but also uh, to reach out to the species at risk sighting and just let us know where you are finding monarchs so that we can uh, get a better idea of where this endangered species is in our province. Okay, so that is what I had prepared today. Um, I think that was about half an hour. Um, so I hope this was useful. Really the target audience here uh, really is trying to encourage the public to feel more comfortable with all of these things. So I hope uh, people learn something. I hope you feel able to pr promote conservation by observing nature on iNaturalist or eBird as an example. And if you do uh, observe uh, some wildlife, you can identify it potentially as a species at risk, if it is, by looking on the federal and provincial legislation. And uh, so now we have some time for questions and uh, yeah, and I'd also love to hear if there's anyone who has ideas for another talk. I have one talk that I thought would be maybe interesting uh, discussing, you know, so federal government has jurisdiction over federal land, provincial government has jurisdiction over provincial land, but on both of those types of land, there's lots of protected areas. And so there's lots of different types of protected areas in Nova Scotia and Canada. And uh, I thought that could potentially be another interesting talk. Um, so, yeah, now I'll just, uh, I think, pass the mic back to... Uh, Thank you. Um, I would say if anyone wants to uh, chat, we have to, so I, I will moderate. If you put things in the chat, I will read out your question if you don't want to turn your mic on. If you would like to just turn your mic on and start in on the conversation, that's great too. Um, so to start, we have, yeah, David says, an iNaturalist, I wish people submitting would add more habitat shots. Any comment? I would say absolutely, David. That's huge. It's the same as in the species at risk guide where we have the, I love the photos of the habitat where you could expect to see the species at risk right beside the photo of the species at risk because you go, okay, is that it? No, it's not the right habitat, you know? So I agree. Yeah, and, and you know, pretend if they're, you know, because another thing, unfortunately, that happens sometimes on uh, iNaturalist, as much as I, you know, I love it, um, you know, sometimes we're not experts at taking photos that the experts can adequately identify. And so if we're including more, um, you know, kind of contextual information like habitat, it can help those observers who are really crucial to help you confirm what species you've seen. So I think you know, you're absolutely right, David. And it's a really, you know, just a really good point. Yeah. Um, I would even add that we could think about a talk of, uh, or like I'm sure I in general, I don't know, but I'm sure people have done this, but how to take better like identifiable wildlife photographer photographs for the general public. Um, okay, from Chad, we have, this might be an interesting talk. Has there been an analysis on how effective federal and provincial species at risk legislation has been? Good question. Yeah, so, um, you know, this is a, this is a subject that quite a few groups are interested in. Um, so yes, and you know, certainly, 
I've read many, many texts kind of about, you know, how effective is the Species at Risk Act. And you can, you know, if you type that into Google, I'm sure you'll find some, um, you know, really well, well written uh, texts about that. Um, this, this talk, I tried to kind of take the angle of, uh, you know, helping the federal and provincial governments with the, just the, you know, the work that they have cut out for them already. Um, just because, you know, and we're kind of wading into kind of personal opinion and also, you know, gauging effectiveness of legislation is a, a little more political than I was hoping to get into. But um, one of the things that I think is worth mentioning is, um, you know, a lot of the people probably on this call know people who are, uh, you know, work uh, for the, either the provincial or federal government, uh, you know, enforcing these laws. And everyone that I know in that situation are incredible environmentalists and they really want nothing more than to do a really good job. Um, and so I think uh, it's a really fun angle to take of thinking how can the public help the uh, provincial and federal governments with this legislation. Um, just kind of, I'm, so I guess I'm saying I'm, I'm a little more interested in, in that angle as opposed to just, you know, is it effective or not? It just because, you know, I think generally speaking, you know, we can always do a bit more conservation and, you know, unfortunately we, uh, with social media, we're often exposed to uh, kind of unfortunate um, environmental issues, which kind of gives us the impression that the, this legislation is not effective. Mm. Um, but I think it is in fact, uh, quite effective, you know, some of the, you know, the wording is, tr they're trying to be really clear, but I think it comes back a lot to this need for data. And that's one of the ways that we can really, you know, maybe the next analysis on how effective they've been, if, if the public has done a lot of work, the conclusions will be that they're more effective now because the public is really engaging well. Yeah. All right. Oh, let's see. Uh, Fair sorry. answer. Thanks, says Chad. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, I see. Sorry, I, I said uh, 2008 for the guide. Actually, 2015. So uh, has been updated, but potentially time to update again. And yeah, it'd be a really, uh, you know, it's a really cool resource. I agree. It'd be fun yeah. to work on that. Um, Nick. Nick. Yeah. Yeah. Tom Herman here. Thanks very much for for the overview. It's it's great to be reminded of the. Uh, of the important role that Canadians played in the uh, very beginning of the species at risk uh, movement. Um, I'm, I, I like your suggestion about a, uh, a talk on uh, the different types of protected areas, because there are a lot of myths out there about around protection and um, uh, yeah, both federally and both federal and provincial uh, protected areas, uh, so that I think that would be uh, very useful for a, for a broad audience. Okay. Um, it might sound like a dry topic, but actually, it's a very important one because we often think that things are protected when they are not, and uh, there are many types of protected areas just in Nova Scotia. Um, yeah. Well, that's uh, yeah. That, yeah. I I agree, and yeah. Uh, well. I'll count that as a vote for uh, for protected areas, and I mean, insofar as you know, people might think it's dry. You know, we got a relatively good uh, turnout today with you know generally extremely unsexy words of historical <laughs> environmental law. People loss. were enthused about legislature. Yeah. I got I was yeah. <laughs> Actually, could could I just add one more comment? If uh, back in response to, to your remarks about the importance of, uh, of observations, whether be they INAT or eBird and so on. I, I sit on the Kasiwek um, as a co-chair for amphibians and reptiles, um, and I can attest to the value of those observations in designating species. Um, they are absolutely invaluable, and the um, the the groups of, of species which have extremely good uh, observations, and I point probably m most to birds. Um, uh, the assessment of birds is uh, so much easier and so much more effective and more successful because of the wealth of observations. And 
for many groups of organisms, we don't have those observations yet, although iNaturalist is beginning to change that. So those observations to iNat are absolutely invaluable. All right. Do you have any uh, kind of comments just uh, about the, you know, how to properly observe uh, amphibians? I, I know, you know, it's kind of a group we don't tend to see a ton of observations for. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, <laughs> um, we've, we've been talking about actually uh, launching another uh, herp atlas for Nova Scotia. And I think that's probably going to happen. We hope it's going to happen. Uh, I don't know if Jeffy's on this call or not. She may want to speak to that if she is. Um, but uh, uh, if, if we do launch another Herp Atlas, I think we'll have much greater success than we had last time, in part because there's so many people that have been introduced to, to INAT and eBird, and we'll use iNaturalist as part of that uh, Herp Atlas. Um, so, but, but there, you're right, there's a lot of education around uh, uh, appropriate ways to observe. Um, and uh, uh, of course, birds are uh, popular with many more sp people probably than uh, amphibians are, and <laughs> unfortunately, but. Uh, <laughs> we don't but want more observations don't need to of birds, we just want more observations of everything else as well. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, so, question from Susan, does it cause problems when a species inhabits intertidal, public, and private land? Um, so certainly, um, you know, it can become uh, more complicated just in so far as then there are potentially maybe uh, both jurisdictions being represented. And we do, in fact, you know, we have lots of species that are uh, listed as federally and provincially endangered, and that might occur on federal and provincial land. Um, but again, that's, you know, and coming back to kind of the effectiveness of, of legislation, you know, it's been my experience that when that is the case, there's a, you know, really good cooperation between the provincial and, and the federal um, people who are working on this. And so, you know, as opposed to it becoming kind of a problem, um, you know, really sometimes it becomes a question of there are just more resources because now we have uh, two levels of government uh, interested in the conservation of those species and you know, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, certainly it, you know, it's maybe more complicated, uh, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily say a problem. All right. Uh, any other questions? Any notes? Things from uh, the folks down at the field station at MTRI? Any things to last last comments? No. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Brittany. Uh, yeah. If anyone has any questions, uh, if you know of someone who wanted to see this uh, but they didn't get to. I'm gonna uh, upload it to the our YouTube. Um, yeah, uh, if there's nothing else, then I will uh, we'll let it go. I have a question. Yes, Jean, what's on, thank you. What's, what's on the menu for next week, Emma? Oh, good question. I always forget that part when I'm trying to get people coming back. Yes, next week we have um, Megan Pagniello. Uh, she is talking about the connectivity of um, highway, I believe it's 102, one of the highways in, in Nova Scotia um, and how that affects uh, wildlife populations. So uh, more talking in the direction of sort of Nova Scotia uh, infrastructure organization. Um, yeah, but this is her master's research. So tune in next week to hear about uh, how highways in Nova Scotia affect wildlife. Perfect. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Emma. <laughs> and thank, thanks very much. Oh, not at all. Oh, Nick's muted. Okay. Sorry, right, guys. Got a call from a doctor there. Oh, thank you, well. everyone, for all those comments. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Also, I had a lot of help uh, figuring out, you know, angles for this talk. So really, I, uh, I appreciate the support I got from everyone. Nice. All right. 
So that's it for this week. Uh, please come back next week and keep your eye out for uh, the seminar list for our uh, seminar speakers for August. We will be continuing them into August and the list of speakers will be out uh, next week, hopefully. Okay, thank you so much. Have a great Thursday and we'll see you next time. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.